We are in this series in the book of Acts. We are preparing for a very big Sunday in the life of our church, Invite Your One Sunday, which is going to happen on August 5th. And uh, I hope that you've been thinking about and praying about who you're going to invite for that day. That's really the big ask that, we're, that we are asking you guys to do. We want every single one of, one of you to invite one person. Uh, to come to church with you on Sunday, August 5th. And uh, we're, we're excited. We, w- we can't wait to see what God is going to do, not only in the life of our church through this, but also in your own life. What is, this, what is God going to do in you and through you in this process? And uh, that's why we're studying the book of Acts this summer. We're spending a, a lot of time looking at this book to see what exactly happened with the early church and how did this begin? How did the church uh, actually start and what did God do in the midst of that? We're also, uh, we have a, a ton of other things that are going on too, including we have our, our prayer nights that are happening on Wednesday nights in preparation for this. We have the evangelism workshops that are happening to get everybody ready and feeling equipped for talking to other people about their faith. So all of these things are going on this summer in preparation for Invite Your One. And so, um, so that's what we're, we're going to continue in this study in the book of Acts this morning. If you have your Bible or if you have a device with the Bible on it, uh, go ahead and open up to Acts chapter 6. We're going to be in chapter 6 today. Um, Now, in the not-too-distant past, in fact, just over the last 50 or 60 years, there's been a major cultural shift in in our country, okay? We've seen a major shift in our country. About 50 or 60 years ago, in America, it was pretty much the cultural norm to be a Christian. Most people would say, yeah, I'm a Christian. And today, we live in a culture that is considered to be post-Christian, meaning that fewer and fewer people are saying that they're Christians. And actually, the largest growing um, demographic, religious demographic in our country is a group of people that they're calling the nuns, and it's not like the N- like nuns. It's uh, N-O-N-E-S, the nuns. These are people who are saying that they do not want to have any religious affiliation whatsoever. In other words, when they have a little form in front of them and it says, re- you know, what religion are you? They click none, all right? And so what this means for us is that as we enter into this, this idea of like, we're going to invite our one and we're going to be talking to people about our faith and all this sort of stuff, what this means is that now more than ever, we are going to be in a, in a place in our, uh, in our country where we're going to experience the most persecution and opposition to the gospel that we've ever seen before in our nation. Okay, that's where we are right now in our country. Now, I don't know, maybe some of you have already experienced that. Maybe some of you have already been at a place where you've talked to someone about your, about your faith and they've come back and said, uh, yeah, you're crazy. <laughs> or, or, you know, or actually started getting, getting uh, angry at you because of what you believe. Um, many of us have experienced that opposition already. And with faith, when we're faced with opposition, we are going to be tempted to do a couple things um, that really we shouldn't. We're going to be tempted to maybe water down what we believe, to take the truth of the Bible and mix it and blend it with uh, some sort of humanistic philosophy in order to make it sound maybe a little more appealing to someone. We're going to be maybe even tempted to do certain things that we know that we shouldn't do in order to win friendships or to gain someone's approval. We may even be tempted to think differently about God. Even in the face of opposition, we may be tempted to think that maybe God isn't really good or that God isn't in control. All of these temptations are very real temptations when we enter into a place of opposition. And church, I think we need to be ready for this. We need to be ready to face opposition. And so the passage that we're going to look at today is really when opposition began to arise against the early church. And we're going to see how the early church responded to it. Now, I'm turning 40 this year, and so uh, I have to wear glasses now. So we're going (laughs) to go ahead and do that. And uh, let's 
go ahead and go to uh, Acts chapter 6. And if you're willing and able, please stand with me as we read this passage. We're going to be starting at verse 8. And Stephen, full of grace and power, was doing great wonders and signs among the people. Then some of those who belonged to the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, and of the Cyrenians, and of the Alexandrians, and of those from Cilicia and Asia, rose up and disputed with Stephen. But they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. Then they secretly instigated men who said, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes, and they came upon him and seized him and brought him before the council. And they set up false witnesses who said, This man never ceases to speak words against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and will change the customs that Moses delivered to us. And gazing at him, all who sat in the council saw that his face was like the face of an angel. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, this morning we ask for the blessing of your Holy Spirit to be here to help us understand your word and to apply it to our life. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. So, a couple things. First of all, whenever I sit down to read a text— uh, I always want to make sure that I'm understanding the context of what's going on. It really helps to understand what's happening in this passage. And I want to ask the question, why did the author put this particular passage in the text where it is? Why is it here? Okay, I'm always asking myself that question. Now, I was looking at this passage, and I'm like, why is this little story about Stephen and persecution and all that stuff happening? And, and the context actually gives us a lot of good information about this. We have to go back a little bit to chapter 5. And in chapter 5, what's happening is the apostles are they're preaching the gospel. They go into the temple, and they're preaching the gospel to people. And as they're doing this, the Jewish leaders uh, that are, that are uh, in Jerusalem at the time, it's a group of 70 men called the Sanhedrin. They, uh, they didn't like what the apostles were doing because they were pulling people away from Judaism. And so they said, well, we got to arrest these guys. And so they went over, they arrested the apostles, they put them in prison. So miraculously, an angel appears and frees the apostles from prison. And as he frees them from prison, the, the, the angel tells the apostles, don't, don't, don't run away, don't flee, don't like try to, you know, hide or whatever, but just go back to the temple and keep preaching the gospel. And so they're like, okay, sounds good, whatever, let's go. And so they, they, they obey the, the angel, they go back to the temple and they start preaching the gospel again. Well, the Sanhedrin, the, the, the Jewish leaders, they're like, what just happened? Like, how did they get out of prison and where are they? Oh, they're in the temple. Let's go get them again. And so they run back over there. They arrest them. They bring them to the Sanhedrin and they're basically trying to figure out what to do with these guys. Now, in the, on the Jewish ruling council, there was one leader. His name was Gamaliel. And Gamaliel was a very well-respected guy in the Sanhedrin. And he uh, offered some advice in chapter 5. And I think that his advice actually is going to set up everything that's going to happen from chapter 5 all the way to chapter 8, okay, of the book of Acts. Let's look really quick at chapter 5, starting at verse 34. He says, But a Pharisee in the council named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law held in honor by all the people, stood up and gave orders to put the men outside for a little while. So he's like, all right, just put those apostles outside. We need to talk, all right? <laughs> Verse 35, and he said to them, men of Israel, take care what you are about to do with these men. For before these days, Theudas rose up, claiming to be somebody, and a number of men, about 400, joined him. He was killed, and all who followed him were dispersed and came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean rose up. In the days of the census, he drew away some of the people after him. He too perished, and all who followed him were scattered. So in the present case, I tell you, keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan or this undertaking is of man, it will fail. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You might even be found opposing God." 
And so Gamaliel is setting up a pattern. He's saying, you know what? In our past, we've seen movements rise up within Judaism, and these movements have a leader, and usually what happens is as we arrest the leader, they end up being executed or killed. And then the, the followers of that movement get dispersed, and every time that that's happened, the movement dies. The movement ends. Now, according to the Jewish leaders at this point, they, they believe that they've killed the leader of Christianity. Jesus has been killed on the cross, right? And they don't believe that he's resurrected from the dead. So they think, okay, well, the leader's been killed, but all of the, the church, the followers of Jesus, are still in Jerusalem, and they're all together, so they haven't been scattered yet. And so what the author of the book of Acts is doing is he's setting up what's going to happen now over the next few chapters leading up to the scattering of Christians in chapter 8. And so what happens? Okay, so check this out. Chapter 6, we are introduced to a guy named Stephen. Stephen, uh, he is uh, elected by the church to help take care of the widows uh, in the church community, all right? And he's described as a man that is full of grace and power and full of the Holy Spirit. He does miraculous signs and wonders. He is a, uh, he is a man of God. In fact, we could say without question that this is a man who is so committed to his faith that he is unafraid and unashamed of living it out day after day. This is, this is who Stephen is, okay? And so when we get to our text here, at the end of chapter 6, we see this opposition arise, right? In verse 9, all of these groups of people start coming against Stephen, and they try to oppose him. But then look at verse 10, chapter 6, verse 10. But they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. So they're coming against Stephen, and they're like, man, we can't, we can't argue with this guy. He's, he's got too much. Like, every time we try to argue with him, we just get shut down. We get to all of our arguments get defeated. And so what do they have to do? In order to silence Stephen, in order to keep him from spreading the gospel— they have to actually bring false accusations against him. They actually, what they do is they, they, it says that they stir up the people against Stephen so that they would arrest him and bring him to the Sanhedrin. And so they do this. And then when they bring him to the Sanhedrin, finally, what happens is, is they, they actually have to bring false witnesses to come in and testify against him. Just terrible, underhanded um, stuff that's going on here in order to silence Stephen. Okay, so Stephen, throughout the whole thing, he maintains his innocence. And I love verse 15 at the end of the very last verse of chapter 6. It says, And gazing at him, all who sat in the council saw that his face was like the face of an angel. Stephen, unashamed of the gospel, completely maintains his innocence. All that he has done is just preach the gospel. And he's being put on trial for this. And so what does he do? Chapter 7. Um, it's an incredible chapter. It's, it's really long because what Stephen does is he spends 52 verses going through the Old Testament, walking through stories from the Old Testament, from Abraham to Joseph to Moses to David, and he lays this whole thing out about how He's not actually trying to defend himself against the accusations. He's actually defending Christianity. And he's trying to prove to them that Jesus is the Christ. But his other point, which I think is really interesting, <laughs> is that the Jewish leaders historically have always missed it. They've all, <laughs> throughout the whole Old Testament, that they've always missed it. That they've always persecuted the prophets who have come to preach that uh, of, of who the Christ is going to be, and that they even ended up persecuting and killing the Messiah himself. Well, this <laughs> throws the Sanhedrin into an outrage, and they end up taking him outside, and they stone him to death. And at the end of chapter 7, Stephen, is, he becomes the first martyr, the first Christian martyr. Now, flip over to chapter 8 with me, because this is where we see the, really the fulfillment of what Gamaliel was talking about in chapter 5. So first it says, and Saul approved of his execution. Well, 
Saul is the man who becomes the Apostle Paul later on. So this is where we are first introduced to the Apostle Paul. Saul is not a Christian, and he is approving of the execution of Stephen. And he says, And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. So there's the scattering that takes place. Verse 2. Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him. But Saul was ravaging the church, and entering house after house, he dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. Now look at verse 4 really quickly. Now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. What, if Really what's happening here is Luke is including this whole thing that Gamaliel said in order to get to this result in chapter 8. That all of this persecution is taking place in order to get to the point where the church would be scattered and we would see without a doubt that this is a movement of God. That this is something that God is doing. Okay? And so I think that through all of this, we're going to see a little bit of how we as Christians today can actually face opposition and persecution. As we are entering more and more into a world where this is going to be a reality, that we need to be ready for this. And so what I want to do today is I want to give you three, uh, just three uh, points on how to face opposition to the gospel from this text this morning. The first thing that we're going to look at is how, to, how we should really expect opposition. The second thing is that we should respond with faith. And the third is that in the midst of opposition, we can trust God's plan. So that's what we're going to talk about here this morning. The first thing, that we can expect opposition. Now, let's just look at Stephen again really quick. Stephen is described as being this incredible guy, right? Full of faith, full of the Holy Spirit, full of wisdom and power, and he's doing miraculous signs. There's literally nothing in this text that describes him in a negative light, which is actually really rare for the Bible. Uh, if you think about that, like there are very few people that are described so positively in the Bible, but Stephen is one of them. And as Stephen is described as being so innocent, so good, that all that he did was preach the gospel, and then he faces this immense persecution, the people decided that he must be silenced because of this message. Now, what I think is interesting about Stephen and even the apostles in this is that there's actually nothing in this text that shows that they were surprised by this. There's nothing in this text that shows us like, oh man, what is happening? What is going on? And I think there's a reason for that. And it's because Jesus told the apostles very clearly that they should expect persecution. If we look at John chapter 15, starting at verse 18, Jesus uh, is talking with his disciples. And this is uh, in the upper room uh, as they take the Last Supper together and, and Jesus is about to go to the cross. And Jesus tells them, listen to what he says. This is verse 18. If the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, Therefore, the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. But all these things they will do to you on account of my name, because they do not know him who sent me. Jesus makes it so clear that if we are following Christ, if we are if, if we are, are doing the things and being obedient to the things that he's asking us to be obedient to, that what's going to happen at the end of the day is that we should expect persecution. We should expect opposition. And so church, we need to be at a place of expecting this. Now, over the last couple of weeks, as we've been talking about in the Invite Your One Sunday, we showed you some statistics about what happens when we invite people to church. And a lot of these statistics are very positive. In fact, I think the statistics are very much in our favor right now. I want to show you the whole picture of this, and I have a little graph up here to show you. Um, 
40% of the people that, that we ask, according to this, the, the statistics here, say that they're just going to say yes. They're like, yeah, you invited me to church. I'm totally there. Awesome. Okay, so that's great news. That's pretty good odds. Now, there's another 40%. We're going to add these two together. These are the maybes, the people that'll, that'll say maybe, and about half of those will actually come to church with you, okay? So what that means is that 60% of the people that we ask are going to be there at church with you on Invite Your One Sunday. 60%. So those are really, really great odds. Now, there's another group, about 15%. They're going to say no, but they're going to do it politely. They're going to say, you know, no thank you. I appreciate the offer. It's not really my thing, you know, <laughs> and they're going to say that. But according to the statistics on this, there is a group of about 5% that not only will they say no, but they will say no with hostility. They will say no with direct opposition to your invitation. And we need to be ready for that. We need to be ready to face that. How can we be ready? I want to give you just three quick things on this. The first is that we can be ready by remembering the words of Jesus from John 15. If we remember that they are not rejecting us, but that they are rejecting him, then that's going to actually free us. It's going to actually free us. It's going to help us to remember, as we remember this, that, that when they say no and they oppose you, that they're not rejecting you, that they're rejecting Christ. And it frees you to not get defensive in the moment, right? To remember, okay, this isn't about me. This is about them and their heart, and they're rejecting the Lord at this point, okay? Okay. So it frees you from getting defensive. And that means, honestly, you don't have to take it personally at that, at that point. Does that make sense? It gives you a lot of freedom. Okay? The second thing is that we can recognize that Christ, or rejecting Christ, rejecting Christ is really a heart problem, not a mind problem. Okay? It is a spiritual issue, not an intellectual issue. In other words, God is going to save people, and it's not up to us to have all the right answers, to have the best argument, to know, you know, to know the Bible backwards and forwards, to be able to answer every question that they have. We don't have to do that. God's not going to put that kind of pressure on us, okay? Now, of course, we, we, we want to be good students of the Bible. We want to be able to answer questions when we can, but you know what? If someone is going to reject an invitation to receive the gospel, it really is an issue of sin in their heart and not an issue of having enough information up here. Years ago, I was a, um, I was a youth director at a church in California, and we had this small little church. We met in this bungalow outside of the—we didn't have like a youth room, so we had like a, like a bungalow type of thing out in the—like a modular building— and we had a, a high school group when I first got there of about eight to ten kids. It was very small. And as I got to know some of the kids at the church, I met this one girl named Erin. And I, I, I noticed one thing. Like, first of all, she never came to youth group. Um, <laughs> she didn't want to have anything to do with it. And, but she would always come to church with her parents. And so I, I, I approached her one day, and I was like, hey, Aaron, how come you never come to youth group? And she's like, oh, I don't know. I just don't feel like I fit in, and I don't have any friends there. And I'm like, okay, well, well, why don't you invite some of your friends, and you guys can all come to, to youth group? And she's like, well, but if I invite my friends, then they're going to ask me, like, why? And I don't have those answers. I don't have all the right answers to, to, to tell them. I'm sure that they're going to have all these questions and things like that. And I'm like, well, but Aaron, you, you don't have to have all the right answers. You don't, you, you don't have, you just have to invite them. You just have to talk to them about, about who God is in your life. And she's like, okay, well, I'll give it a try. This is, this is unbelievable because she started doing this. She invited four of her friends to come to youth group and all four of them came and they all loved it. They all loved being there and they're like, this is so great. And those four friends started inviting their friends. And within a year, 
we had this group of eight to 10 grew to about a group of about 35, all right? Which is so crazy. And it's all because this one girl decided to invite her friends. And that was it. So we had, we, we had 35 kids that were hearing the gospel. It's so cool. But what she had to realize was that, that the, 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 the spiritual issue that's going on in, uh, in, in our lives where, we, where, we, uh, where people reject the gospel, that, um, that really that's not up to her to fix. That's something that God does through his spirit. And what that means for you and me is that, again, it frees us. It frees us from having to know all the answers, but it also should drive us to our knees in prayer. And that's the third thing. We need to be praying for the people that we're going to invite. Church, if I can give you any sort of instruction or even I, if I can even say that this could be like something I would, I would just command you guys to do is do not have a conversation with your one without praying first. Pray for them. Pray for them first because here's the, the reality of this is that only God can free their heart to accept the invitation that you're going to give them. Only God can free their heart to respond to the gospel. And that means that we need the work of the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit to be working in them to free them, to get them ready to receive the invitation that you are going to make to them. Does that make sense? Now next weekend, next weekend, Pastor Mitch is going to be speaking and he's, his whole message is from Acts 12 and it's going to be on the importance of prayer in this. And so um, be here next weekend. It's going, to be, uh, it's going to be so important for us uh, to learn about the importance of prayer in this. Uh, but, so we're going to dig into that more next weekend. But I just want to say that for now, that we can really expect opposition and that we can be ready to face it as it comes. Okay, so here's the second thing that when we, so that's sort of like the preparatory work, right? What happens when we actually face that opposition? And how do we respond with faith? That's what we want to do is respond with faith. Well, turn back to that passage in, in Acts chapter 6. And again, just verse 10 is so great because we see, you know, all of these, these different groups are coming up against Stephen, but they can't argue with him. Why? But they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. Oh man, that is, that is so, so good. Because here's, here's the thing. And Scott talked about this before, um, that Jesus actually promises that the Holy Spirit is going to help us when we face opposition. Back in Luke chapter 12, verses 11 and 12, this is what Jesus tells us. He says, And when they bring you before the synagogues and the rulers and the authorities, do not be anxious about how you should defend yourself or what you should say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. That's a promise from our Lord. So when we face opposition, we can trust the Holy Spirit. We can trust that he is going to help us in that time of opposition. Does that make sense? I mean, it's just it's clear as crystal right in there. I'm like, wow, it's so cool. Um, but then I think the second thing is that we should stand firm. The second thing here is that we should stand firm. And this is a, actually a really interesting command from the New Testament. This is one of the most often repeated commands that we see in the New Testament. It's repeated 13 times that we are to stand firm. And in particular, what this means is that we are to stand on God's word. To stand on God's word. Now, Stephen, when he faced opposition, he didn't compromise his beliefs, right? He didn't water down the gospel. He didn't recant. What did he do? He spent 52 verses going through the Old Testament talking about what God had done throughout the Old Testament leading up to the coming of Christ. He stood on God's word through the whole thing. Now, um, here's, here's the thing. I, I think that we become tempted in, when we face opposition to water down the gospel, to try to blend it with uh, some sort of humanistic philosophy 
or to try to, um, to make it more palatable for people. Maybe sometimes it's about taking sin out of the picture, that the reality of sin is not really there. Um, you know, church, we can't do that. When we, are, when we are in the face of opposition, we need to stand firmly on God's word. Because this book is the perfect revelation of our reality. This book, above all other ideas, all other of, of, of man's ideas about what is going on in our world and, and how we can interpret the reality that we live in, all of it pales in comparison to God's word. And God's word stands supreme above all of those things. And what this means for you and me is that we should never blend this with some sort of humanistic philosophy. We should never water this down. But we should, stand, we should know it and stand firmly on it every single day. Okay? And so to stand on God's word is so critical. We see that in, in, this, uh, in this section as well. Okay, so we looked at expecting opposition. We looked at this idea here of, um, <clears throat> of responding with faith. And then finally, I want to talk about trusting God's plan. Now, this whole section from chapter 5 to chapter 8, we looked at how through all of this that Luke is really laying out this, this picture where, you know, this is set up where there's this pattern where the leader is going to be killed and, and, then, and then the people are going to be scattered, Right? And so there's all of these, these tragic events that happen in the life of the church. The opposition that arises, the martyrdom of Stephen, and then finally the scattering of the church. And people are being, being dragged out of their homes and put into prison. And these are, these are tragic events that are taking place. But I think what Luke wants us to see in this book is that these are events that God has allowed to happen in order for the greater purpose of the spreading of the gospel to take place. I think we could put it this way, that God had a bigger plan that included these tragic events in order to accomplish his purposes. Now church, we struggle with this. We struggle with this because we don't like to think of God um, in a way where it's like he would even allow these tragic events to happen. It, it messes with our idea of God. In fact, it puts us in a position where we think that we have to, to basically believe one of two things. It puts us in a position where we believe either A, you know, God, he's good. God is a good God, but you know what? He's not really in control of things. Or we're in this other camp where it's like, well, God's in control of things, but he's not very good, and he doesn't have my best in mind. It forces us to, to we think that it forces us to go into one of those two camps. But if we're going to stand on God's word in the midst of that, that kind of op, uh, opposition and persecution, then we have to go back to God's word and to see that actually God is both. He is fully in control, and he is very, very good. Now, um, I, uh, I debated a lot about talking about this today because I didn't want to draw attention to this, this part of our life. Um, and I've never talked about this before uh, out, out here, but I, I wanted to share this story with you. Um, this is something that I think God has been really working on in my life and in my wife's life over the last couple years. This idea that God is both good and, and that he's sovereign at the same time. Um, it's a theological truth that, that I think that I've learned a while back. But um, over the last two years, we've been really tested to see if this is um, something that we're actually going to believe in. And it all kind of revolves around uh, our son. His name is Caleb. And a lot of you guys have been following Caleb's story. This is him back here. <laughs> uh, a lot of you guys have been following our son's story through uh, Erica's Facebook posts and things like that and, uh, and whatnot, but I just want to tell you a little bit about him. Uh, we weren't expecting to have another kid. We have two older daughters, and 
all of a sudden we're like, oh, surprise, uh, we're, having a, we're having a son. And, uh, and so we, uh, we were very surprised by that. And so, uh, and then when he was born, um, pretty much the, the day that he was born, we, we kind of knew that there was something off, there was something wrong. And we found out a few months later that he has a genetic condition that's called neurofibromatosis. Um, that's a lot to say, so we call it NF, <laughs> all right? NF1 is the type that he has. And NF1 is this disease that affects the, um, there's like a coating around our nervous system. And it affects that, that coating. And what it does is it, it allows um, these benign tumors to grow on his nervous system. So right now, he's got a tumor that's on his eye. And it, you know, it's on the, his eyelid, it's kind of behind his eye as well. And so, uh, we, we really struggled, I think, to start thinking about how do we think about this in terms of, of God? Like, how do we think about this in terms of the theology that we've been learning? Because on one side, we can come over here and we could say, you know, God is really good. He's a good God. But if he's not in control, then that means that he really has no ability whatsoever to, <laughs> to do anything about this or to stop it or to prevent it. If we came over to this other side and we said, you know, God, God is sovereign and he's totally in control, but that means that he doesn't really have our son's best in mind. That this is actually a terrible disease and he's purposed this in his life for no reason. But you know what? We go back to the scriptures and we read stories like the story of Joseph. And Joseph, such a fascinating story. You know, he, he, was, he was beaten and sold into slavery by his own brothers. He was, he was put in prison. And all of these terrible events ended up proving to actually be something that was very good in the end. And so Joseph, in Genesis 50, 20, he, he, he confronts his brothers and he says, you know, you meant these things for evil, but God, he meant them for good. God meant them for good. Wow, it, it, it means that there's a, there was an intentionality behind this. There was a purpose behind it. We read the story of Job. Here's another example. Job, he's described as a righteous man. And even though he was a righteous man, his family was killed, and his, uh, all of his wealth <laughs> was taken away. His wife who's the only one who's left in his family, she's kind of in the camp over here that says God's sovereign, but he's not good. And so she comes up to Job and is like, Job, you should just curse God and die. <laughs> but Job says no. He's like, I, I'm going to believe that God is both sovereign and good, and I'm going to trust his plan. You know, the Apostle Paul, he even puts it this way. In Romans chapter 8, Verse 28, he says, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. Church, what this means for us is that there is no opposition that you will face. There's no persecution that you will endure. There are no difficult circumstances in your life that you will have to go through that is outside of God's perfect and loving plan for you. And that's hard for us to swallow sometimes. But if we believe that, based off of what God's word says, if we believe that, then what that means is that yes, God is in control. And God has a very good plan, even for the painful circumstances that we go through. That there is hope and there is a reason for it. In fact, we can think about the tragic events that happened around Stephen. And his death, his martyrdom, the persecution that came against the church. And we can see all of these, these tragic events, but you know what? There is no tragic event that God has purposed that outweighs the tragedy of the death of his own son. 
that Jesus went to the cross willingly and he did that for you and me. See, Jesus didn't want to, right? In the Garden of Gethsemane, he went down on his knees and he was praying to God, God, take this cup from me. I don't want to go to the cross. But he said, not my will, but yours be done. And even in his agony, even as he sweat drops of blood, he became obedient to death, even death on a cross. But the story didn't end there. The story doesn't end there because three days later, Jesus rose again. And because of the resurrection, the resurrection actually proves to us that God has a bigger plan. That even the suffering that we experience has a purpose. The resurrection means that we have hope. The resurrection means that God's plan This bigger, perfect, loving plan that he has, that it will not be thwarted even by death itself. That's what the resurrection means. And so church today, when we face opposition, when we face persecution, when we even when we face difficult circumstances in our life, church, we have hope. We have hope because we know that we have a loving God who is good and he is sovereign and He has purposed these things in your life for your good, whatever it is that you're going through. And so we can trust him. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, I praise you. I praise you that you are a perfect, loving, and sovereign God. And God, as we expect persecution to happen in our life and as we face it with faith. Help us to remember every single day that the things that we go through have a good and perfect purpose that's found in you and that purpose will not be thwarted. Lord, thank you so much for this incredible grace towards us. And help us to trust you today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.